It's a pleasure and an honor for us to have President Eisgruber as our Yom Kippur Afternoon Forum speaker. President Eisgruber was a member of the, it says great, but I'll say the great Princeton class of 1983. And he has served as the university's 20th president since 2013. He is one of the world's best known constitutional scholars, a gifted teacher. And that's why we are so interested in your topic, both as the president of this university, where you have kept things quieter than others <laughs> and calmer. We are grateful for your leadership in all areas of the university, but specifically this past year. Please join me in welcoming President Christopher Eisgruber. Thank you, Rabbi. Well, I'm very honored. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be rasping today. It's something of a professional uh, hazard, so I hope my voice will at least hold up and maybe get a little bit stronger as I go along. But I am I'm honored by this invitation to speak with you on this, the holiest of days in the Jewish calendar. If I may, I would like to start on a personal note and tell you a bit about my family history. My great-grandfather, Solomon Kalish, was a lawyer in Breslau, Germany, and a prominent member of the reform community in that city. He's buried in Haifa, Israel, having died there in 1934 while visiting two of his sons who escaped persecution and murder in Germany only because they were able to make Aliyah to what was then mandatory Palestine. Solomon had three sons, and his eldest was my grandfather, Hans. Hans was among the fortunate minority who obtained American visas. He, along with my grandmother and my mother, who was at the time an eight-year-old girl, arrived in New York City in May of 1940. They escaped in the nick of time. As some of you know, my mother concealed her Jewish identity throughout her adult life, hiding it from her husband, her children, and everyone else. My sisters believe that my mother simply for preferred to be Catholic, taking advantage of the distinctly American freedom to choose one's religion and remake oneself. I believe something darker which is that my mother concluded after a childhood in which she was chased from Europe by a genocidal army that being Jewish was a dangerous way to exist in the world. I think that she wanted to protect her children from the terrifying threats that she had experienced, so she tried to erase our Jewish identities forever. It was my son's fourth grade family history project in 2008 that led me to discover my Jewish identity and I embraced it immediately. Because of the story that I have just told you, this is almost certainly the first time that an adult descendant of Hans Kalish has spoken at or indeed entered a synagogue on Yom Kippur. And in light of this story, it's both ironic and distressing that my topic this afternoon pertains to the rising incidents of anti-Semitism in America, including, but not limited to, on college campuses. Up until last year, I could say that I had neither experienced nor personally observed any anti-Semitic comment or act on the Princeton campus in the nearly 45 years since I first arrived here as a freshman. I can no longer say that. I have myself been the target of anti-Semitic comments or behavior twice in the past six months. I know that at least some of our Jewish students, faculty, and staff have had similar experiences. We are unfortunately being reminded yet again in Princeton, in America, and around the world that as my mother apparently concluded, being openly Jewish 
can be a dangerous way to exist in the world. I want to be clear about this. I believe that anti-Semitism remains rare at Princeton University. Indeed, I believe, though I know that not everyone will agree, that anti-Semitism is rare, even among those on our campus who protest against the actions of the Israeli government. I also believe that Princeton University continues to be a wonderful place to be Jewish. I feel that personally, and it is consistent with what our students report, both in personal conversation and in the surveys that we conduct. Princeton's Jewish students report levels of satisfaction and belonging as high or higher than those of other campus groups. And that was true even amid the tumultuous events of last year. These are statistical averages, and there are no doubt exceptions. But in general, the overall experience of Jewish students on the Princeton campus has been very good. We need to bear in mind that all these things can be true at the same time. A college or a town can be a very good place for Jews, and it can also experience a disturbing uptick in anti-Semitic statements or acts. We must respond firmly to anti-Semitism, and we must simultaneously recognize the goodness of our communities and protect the principles that are vital to them. That insight is essential in this fraught moment when some people wrongly urge campuses to fight anti-Semitism by compromising their commitment to free speech. Let me say a bit about that commitment as a matter first of constitutional law and then of university policy. The United States has what I regard as the most powerful protections for free speech of any nation in the world. Those protections emanate from a principle announced by Justice Brennan in the 1964 case of New York Times versus Sullivan where he wrote that, and I will quote now, debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. And it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. In the 60 years since Justice Brennan wrote that sentence, the Supreme Court has taken nearly to its logical limit the protection of uninhibited debate and vehement, caustic, and unpleasantly sharp attacks, and not just on public figures. Perhaps the starkest example is the 2011 decision in Snyder versus Phelps. The case dealt with the Westboro Baptist Church, which picketed military funerals and directed cruel homophobic slurs at the families of fallen soldiers. The church thereby generated free publicity for its hateful antipathy toward gay rights. By an eight to one vote, the Supreme Court held that this rather awful speech was constitutionally protected. Chief Justice Roberts acknowledged the pain caused by the church's cruel speech, but he said that we cannot react to that pain by punishing the speaker. And I'm quoting from Justice Roberts here, as a nation, we have chosen a different course to protect even hurtful speech on public issues to ensure that we do not stifle public debate. American free speech law presupposes that the harms of censorship are worse than the harms caused by vehement, caustic, or unpleasantly sharp or cruel speech. In other words, our constitutional doctrine presupposes that even well-intentioned censors have a tendency to suppress speech unnecessarily, and it recognizes that censors are not always well-intentioned, even in democracies. I agree with those judgments. In my view, censorship here and elsewhere has a lousy track record. 
As a private institution, Princeton University is free to depart from the Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence. We could, if we wished, take a more restrictive attitude toward hurtful speech. Because free speech is the lifeblood of a great research university, however, we have chosen a path very much like the one taken by the United States Supreme Court. Princeton promises its students and its faculty, in the words of our rules and regulations, the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. We explicitly affirm that the university should not attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions that they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. Princeton also steadfastly protects academic freedom, which gives professors enormous latitude about what they say in their articles and what they assign for their classes. Of course, as I say to students at the beginning of each academic year, free speech is not an end in itself. Free speech is necessary to what a university does, but it is in no way sufficient to create the kinds of conversations and discussions upon which our teaching and research depend. If people shout at and disparage one another, there's plenty of free speech, but not much learning. Research and education require not only that we speak, but that we listen and that we learn from one another. Justice Louis Brandeis, America's first Jewish Supreme Court justice and one of this country's greatest justices, said that the First Amendment was written for a people who were courageous, self-reliant, and confident in the power of free and fearless reasoning. I agree with Justice Brandeis that free speech presupposes courage and self-reliance. And I would add that it also requires several other qualities, including mutual respect, empathy, and careful listening. A society committed to free speech must teach these virtues in its colleges and universities and elsewhere. What we ought not to do, what we cannot do, is to censor the speech that we hate. As I said earlier, we must recognize the goodness of our communities and protect the principles that are vital to them. I will close with one further reflection about anti-Semitism past and present and how we might respond to it. Last month, I had an opportunity to get a personal tour led by historians Danny Green and Lisa Leff of a special exhibition on Americans and the Holocaust at the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum. It is a fascinating exhibition, and I recommend it to you if you have not seen it. There's a good online version available if you cannot get to Washington. Among the many interesting facts in the exhibit, I was riveted by this one. In 1938, 94%, 94% of Americans said that the Nazi treatment of Jews was wrong. But nevertheless, 71% of Americans opposed allowing more Jewish exiles into the United States. This pattern recurs throughout World War II and afterward, a recognition of the harms done and an unwillingness to open the borders of the United States to refugees. Americans understood that Jews were being persecuted, but they refused to allow more refugees into the country. Imagine how many lives might have been saved if more visas were granted. The public's opposition to doing so was no doubt attributable in part to anti-Semitism. It was also clearly attributable, in part, to a more general anti-immigrant sentiment. Imagine how many lives might be saved today if more visas were granted to refugees 
desperately seeking safety in the United States. I left the exhibition at the Holocaust Museum with these thoughts, which I offer for your consideration today. Certainly, we must all stand up and speak out forcefully against anti-Semitism. Indeed, we should stand against hatred of all kinds. At the same time, we should remember not only what we stand against, but what we stand for. We should welcome the stranger. We should recognize the essential dignity of each individual human being. We should do what we can to repair the world. We should recognize the goodness at the heart of our communities, protect the principles that are vital to them, and push ourselves to be ever more faithful to our highest aspirations. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. I'm happy to have you do so, Rabbi, if you would like to do that. Okay. So I need to repeat the question? No, I'm going to say, if you would like to ask a question, come on down to here, and I will have them speak it. Okay, I think that would be best. Risha de Ravel. Um, President Eisgruber, thank you for your great comments about free speech, but in order for a student to be comfortable on campus, the delivery, the manner, the place, the style, everything contributes to whether or not the student feels like they are in a place where they can learn. How, if, if all speech is permitted, then it sounds like the only thing you can control is the style, the context, and the manner, and, and the place? Well, I, we, we may control even less than you assume. So the, the, the style of the speech, I actually don't think we can control or should control. Let me put it that way. I want to say should. I don't think we should be controlling the style of speech, either in the United States under our laws or on uh, college campuses. We can sometimes control the time, place, and manner of speech. So in classrooms, just as here, there are a set of rules that apply about how students speak. We can require a certain kind of decorum within classroom uh, settings. We, we can make regulations uh, for dormitories and so on. But ultimately, we want there to be free and unrestrained speech. We, we want to educate our students to speak to one another civilly whenever possible and constructively and to understand one another. But ultimately, we recognize that some of the arguments that go on on a college campus, either in classrooms or in dormitories, in the, in the dining halls, or when protest takes place, may be impassioned and angry at times. And that is an important part of free speech, too. So we don't believe that we can uh, shut that down. What we can try to do is educate students around the virtues of civility and of uh, mutual respect. We can stand for that ourselves. We can exemplify it. We can create uh, institutions within the university. The Center for Jewish Life is one of those that brings students together and actively teach those virtues. But what I don't believe we can do or should do, either in the university or um, in the country more broadly, is to censor the speech that makes us uncomfortable. And I'll say this last thing about this. Comfort is a standard that makes me very uncomfortable, right? Because I think our campuses must be places where students are able to thrive, where they can feel that they are respected and where they are welcomed, but where they are indeed going at times to be uncomfortable. We want students to encounter some kinds of speech and argument that will make them uncomfortable. We want to stretch them beyond their comfort zones at various points. And we understand that even when speech is not as civil as we would want it to be, it's better to have exposure at times to that uncomfortable speech, which will be part of their adult lives in the world, than to insulate them uh, from, it, from it and uh, protect them. So we admit the discomfort 
partly as, as a necessary part of the educational process and partly as something that is better than, than what you get from censorship, which is necessary to comfort. Thank you for the question. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here and doing this. As a member of the Jewish Princeton community, it means a lot, especially at this time, and talking about these subjects. Um, and I would just say, um, full disclosure, I am a free speech absolutist, so I appreciated all your comments about the Constitution. I had two questions. The first is, if there was a student on the Princeton campus shouting, gays are not allowed, or if you had a student who was dressed in a KKK uniform or even just holding up a KKK uniform. What would you, as a university president and the administration, do in those instances? So first of all, let, 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 let me emphasize this. Everything I have just said applies across all kinds of speech, right? Uh, regardless of uh, what individual or uh, group might be offended by that speech, uh, we have a fair amount of provocative homophobic speech that takes place on the Princeton campus. There, there's a group that comes pretty regularly and sets up a table alongside Washington Road that puts them uh, on, uh, in, in a public forum under the Supreme Court's doctrine. It's actually not within the university's control, even if we were otherwise to try to control. And they sell, shout insults at our students, usually based on gender or sexuality. But I'm talking about students and on the campus Well, I, the answer is no different. Okay. The answer is no different. And, and the, uh, we've, we, we've had students sponsor speakers from outside. I've had multiple controversies around the articulation of the N-word where we have uh, protected that on the campus. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a conversation about it, right? And, and the second thing to say is about any kind of speech like this, there are Right, so there are, there are limited exceptions that apply uh, if, a, um, uh, if you have a genuine threat or harassment, and this is within the meaning of the law, within the meaning of the law in the world's most speech protective country, right? But depending on where this is taking place, whether it's not, it's personally directed, whether it's so pervasive that you can't escape it uh, in some way, those are the differences, and that's true whether the offensive speech is anti-Semitic, anti-black, homophobic, or whatever. The standards are the same. And the last thing I would say about this, because my general counsel always tells me to say this, right? Is it's not what I, as the president, would do at that point. That gets submitted, right? If there's a complaint about speech and someone says, that was offensive and I felt it was a threat or I felt that it was harassment that I can no longer exist on this campus, it, it goes to uh, our, our Title IX officer who then has a responsibility to adjudicate it. I don't adjudicate it. Please tell my general counsel I said that. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, and I appreciate that it's uniform across the board because I think yeah. what Jews are feeling is that there's a permissibility for anti-Semitism that isn't extended elsewhere. Um, I also was wondering, have any students been disciplined for any of the actions that took place last year? Yes. Okay, so there is, I think, because another concern I think is, it's one thing to have something that's free speech, like you know, flying a Hezbollah flag, um, but it's another thing when there are people who can't enter rooms, then there are people who are facing um, actual physical concerns and other universities haven't enforced those rules, and so I'm glad to hear that when there are actual violations, Princeton is enforcing those yes, rules. Yes, I wrote in a column last, uh, last spring, some of you may have seen in the, in the Daily Princetonian to make sure that it reached students, about time, place, and manner regulations, which include the regulation that you can't, for example, take over a building or pitch tents and create an encampment. We enforce those uh, rules against uh, students and others who uh, attempted to do that. Yes. Hi, Joshua Zinder. Um, so, two questions, I guess. Uh, but first, um, you had mentioned that there are surveys of the Jewish community on campus and that uh, there's a relatively high level of satisfaction. I'm curious if um, in the Muslim community you find the same thing, high level of satisfaction. I think often um, dissatisfaction leads to scapegoating. So I'm curious um, if, that, if that similar level of satisfaction exists. And then the second question I have is um, with the free speech challenges you're talking about, um, you know, the critical issues at hand 
Um, and I think even within the Jewish community, there's some people who might question some of the actions of, of the Israeli government. Um, how do you deal with the notion of uh, divestment um, with those challenges? So uh, on the first question, um, uh, what I would say is we, uh, we have high levels of satisfaction across the Princeton student body with their education, but it varies across groups. Uh, our Jewish students report some of the highest levels of satisfaction on the campus. Our uh, Muslim students uh, report levels of satisfaction that are lower, I would say, than uh, average. So one of the things that we do as we look at our campus and pursuant to the principles that I mentioned earlier is to look at which groups may be below, again, what is a high overall average, and ask what it is that we can do to make sure that they feel welcome and able to thrive on the, uh, on the campus. Uh, but I will tell you this, that it, and I don't, I don't want to put a lot here on the uh, differences in experience from year to year because they're small, and I'm not sure that they would hold up if you had a lot of statistical analysis applied to them. But the uh, satisfaction data for all of our student groups, and for this I would in include uh, uh, our Jewish students, our Muslim students, and our Middle Eastern and North African students, was higher in the year that just ended than it was in the uh, previous year. All of the numbers showed a slight uh, increase. I take that as a sign that in a very difficult time, we were able to do a lot for most of the students on the campus to make sure that they were still able to thrive on the campus. But we do see differences in those two groups. The second question you asked was around uh, our divestment process. Uh, uh, we have a, a process at Princeton that recognizes First of all, that uh, as a university, our principal mission is uh, teaching and research. And we say teaching and research with a pervasive commitment to service, but we are a scholarly institution first and foremost. And we try to have an impact through that teaching and research rather than through decisions that we make around investment policy. But we recognize that in very rare cases, there may be times when the community as a whole feels it important to uh, divest. There's a process that involves uh, uh, a committee that includes faculty, undergraduates, graduate students, staff, and alumni, which then makes recommendations to the Board of Trustees. And they are instructed that they should only make a, a recommendation in the very rare case where there's a persistent long-term interest in an issue, the issue connects to the values of the university, and there is a consensus within the university about how to respond to the issue at, at both the kind of the general moral level and at a more particular level. So right now we have had a committee which at the behest of a, of a student group has looked at this to determine whether or not those criteria, including the criterion of uh, consensus, are met. A previous committee looked at this issue with regard to um, Israel and uh, Palestine and uh, concluded that the issue was quintessentially one where the absence of a consensus was present rather than a consensus. But that's how we uh, look at investment. Hello, I'm Sarah Jess. Thank you very much for being here. Um, in the year 2000, there was, in the year 2000, there was a series of investigative articles in the Daily Princetonian that showed a rather significant decline in Jewish enrollment at the university over the past number of years prior to your time and in 2000. And I wondered if you would be able to give us some information about this current Jewish enrollment at the university and in the time since you've been the president. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can give you um, uh, statistics on the level of enrollment of Jewish students, and of course, we, it, we you know, we at this point, as universities uh, look at this, I guess what I would say is there are um, uh, 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 some things I can say about uh, general trends, but also some things I can say about the law. One is that the law, law uh, prohibits us from looking at uh, ethnic or other categories when we are deciding whom it is that we should. Uh, admit. The second thing I can say is the most general trend that we have seen since the time that you describe is that the number of Asian and Asian American students on our campus and many other college campuses 
has um, increased very significantly. And as that number has increased, these percentages all have to add up to 100, and other percentages have come down at the same time. So I would say we have a healthy and strong Jewish community on the uh, Princeton campus, but we don't collect that data in a way where I can give you um, strong numbers about how many students there are. I think we have about three or four more. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Pfaff. Um, and and I, I liked what you said about, you know, the, the, that speaking and so on is important, but having bounds on things like encampments and things like this, that, you know, it can be a discussion instead of um, something that, that, that's creating barriers and so on. And it's connected to, there's a particular phrase, so I'm a university professor, I've been on a lot of campuses recently, there's a particular phrase that, uh, gets to me and always makes me feel like, how is this allowed? Um, so I was wondering about your <laughs> opinion of this. Um, so I see a lot of signs on a lot of campuses all across the US and Canada that say globalize intifada. Um, and I was wondering like your stance on that. Yeah, so um, what I would say about this, first of all, I'm, I'm just having given the answer at greater length, going to repeat my general counsel's admonition that, that if, a, if a student feels that the use of that phrase in a certain context is creating an atmosphere which makes it impossible for them to get an education, right, they can make a complaint to the, the Title IX office. It's not about their feeling at the end of the day, right? It's about whether or not there is some sort of pervasive atmosphere. But here's what I would say about, about the, the phrase, and I understand what I'm about to say is, is uh, controversial. There are multiple interpretations uh, to that phrase, right? There are multiple interpretations as well to the, the phrase that has in some ways been, been more talked about, about uh, from the river to the sea, right? And, and the, both the New York Times and the Washington Post have, have run articles about uh, that phrase and its multiple uh, meanings. Uh, we allow for the use of, of phrases in all sorts of contexts that are discomforting, that cause anger, that are offensive, uh, and, and that may be uh, ambiguous. So. Uh, what I would say is that there can't be any prohibition on that language, although I understand and our, you know, our Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs, Amanda Jamal, who is perhaps the most distinguished Palestinian American political scientist, has, has urged students to express themselves in different ways. That's different from saying that I can censor the phrase or the university can censor it or even that my Title IX officer can censor the phrase. It has not been seen as a threat or harassment in the context of the university or of, a, of a, something that would precipitate imminent violence in, in a way where uh, it would justify censorship of it. And let me say one f final thing about this, which I actually think is part of what the American uh, system is supposed to do, at least on our campus for a period of time, right? And we're seeing evolution and, and some of the, it, it, there was again another Times article talking about these groups and the, the way some of their rhetoric is hardening again. But there was a period on our campus where as a result of internal discussions within the protesting groups, they stopped using some of these phrases because some members of the protesting group convinced the others that they were not the appropriate way to make those uh, statements. It doesn't mean, by the way, that they stopped doing all sorts of things that I thought they shouldn't be doing, right? Including some that at times I thought were, were breaking rules that we needed to enforce. But the, uh, but the American commitment, which is, which uh, again, as Brandeis said, requires an extraordinary kind of courage and resilience is to allow those conversations to take place rather than having authorities censor the language. And I actually think if one looks at what happened on some other campuses which had worse experience than, than ours, the instinct to censor produces a kind of backlash in addition to being wrong that makes things worse. Sorry, that was a long answer. I'll try to get to the last two. Thank you for speaking with us, President no. Eisgruber. I'm Uriah Lin. I'm a freshman from Israel. Um, and I appreciate your take on free speech. I wanted to ask about the guidelines of the university um, 
when coming to free speech and what is deemed as free speech and what is the boundary between free speech and hate speech and also what type of advice you would give to Israeli students on campus that want to be politically active but are discouraged by statements that are very much directly targeted towards their own identity. Yeah. So on the, on the first one, the, the relevant distinction within uh, American constitutional law, and I'm very grateful to you for raising the question because I think it goes to a common misunderstanding, is not between free speech and hate speech. The United States Constitution and the principles of Princeton University protect a lot of speech that is hateful. I summarized the case of Snyder versus Phelps, which was awful speech, right? I, I mean, people standing outside of funerals with grieving parents throwing slurs at them in order to get attention. The Supreme Court said, apologies, uh, the Supreme Court said that speech is protected, and they said it by an eight to one vote. It's right in the center of American constitutional law. The line for American constitutional law and the line on our campus has to do with what's a threat. What's libelous under the law? Again, an American libel law gives you more freedom than just about any other uh, libel law. Uh, uh, what, what constitutes harassment within the meaning of the law, not just somebody's feeling of offense, not what's hateful, because we think it's better to endure the harms of hateful speech than to authorize censors to suppress it. That is, that is our judgment. Then the second question you asked, which I'm also very grateful for, about how any of us can speak up, how Israeli students can speak up, or how any of us can speak up for causes that um, may be unpopular uh, in, in, in certain circles that, that, that may um, uh, be the subject of, of protest or uh, the subject of other kind of, of social sanction at times, is what I would say is I think those are the places where these virtues that Justice Brandeis described and that I added to a bit are most important. I think when people treat their listeners respectfully, most of their listeners will respond respectfully. So I think one of the great problems we have in the United States right now is we have a set of media that privilege the provocative, the extreme, the zany, right? In, in, a, in a world of tweets, the, the things that are said that are uh, most, I don't know, stinging, are the ones that get the most uh, attention. Uh, but I think if one can speak moderately, if one can find ways to call people in, if one can find ways to meet them in a personal space, if one can speak soberly and, and with facts and with reason, many people I know on our campus will respond in, this, in that way. Not all of them will, right? Some people will respond angrily, some people will respond irresponsibly, but that, that is part of what it is to try to make a point. Yeah. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Um, Marilyn Tal, I, you, in, in your talk, you spoke about the need not just for free speech, but also for careful listening and for discussion and dialogue. And I was wondering if you could um, describe some of the ways that the, that the university is actually encouraging um, careful listening, discussion, and dialogue, because I think out here in the community, it's not something that we see very much. Yeah. Well, I think the, the easiest place to see it is in our classrooms, right? I, I mean, the, um, the uh, core of our educational enterprise is all around uh, respectful listening and uh, dialogue. It's at the heart of what any good faculty member does in their classroom or in their seminar. But it extends far beyond that, actually, and I don't think it's hard to observe. It extends to the kinds of sessions led by all of the people in our Office of Religious Life as they bring students uh, together. It extends to things that I do, like the uh, pre-read seminars. I go out to our freshmen and talk to them about topics like we're talking about now and try to get them to talk to me about how they see the world. <coughs> I'm going to run out of steam here with my voice, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, do you have time for two more? Um, <coughs> time. Yes, if you, if, you, if you permit me one of my cough drops, I'll be okay. <laughs> I have a young man and an elder of our congregation. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Brody Kushner. I'm 16 years old. I'm a junior in high school. And 
I've heard two major messages from your speech. Number one, that you're a huge proponent of free speech, even if it may make certain people on college campuses feel uncomfortable, that it's very beneficial for personal growth. And number two is that one of Princeton's major goals is to, for college students and everybody on campus to feel represented, to feel happy, and to feel safe. So my question to you is, um, is universal safety and happiness, would that be possible for everybody on college campus if free speech is permitted and certain messages that may be viewed as hateful, if they were still allowed to be spoken and followed? Yeah, well, well let me start with this I, I, a philosoph controversial philosophical claim. I'm not sure universal safety and happiness is possible for any of us in the human condition, right? I, I, I just mean, Part of what we do is to take risks in various ways, which are unsafe. I would not urge you necessarily to lead the safest possible life. I would lead, urge you to lead one that aims at our highest aspirations. And some of that may involve taking risks in various sorts of, of ways, right? Um, uh, and with regard to happiness, I think all of us look for a kind of thriving or flourishing, but I think that flourishing may require discomfort, right? At least from my standpoint, um, the ability to truly engage in arguments in a way that free speech makes possible uh, is essential to the kind of happiness that matters most to who we are as human beings. So what I would say is, um, I, you know, there's there's no nirvana that uh, that I can offer to you, and I think it would be a mistake to try to achieve one in an educational uh, uh, setting. Uh, but that the best practical way forward is to ensure that uh, that people are able to have this freedom of speech. And by the way, let me just add this: right, what I have said is true about a university, but I just want to remind you that this echoes also the, the founding aspirations of our country, the most fundamental aspirations of the United States, right? We, we seek to be a country at our best, where everybody this, in this extraordinary diverse society feels welcome and able to thrive, and where we are all able to say the things that are on our mind, including at times, in ways that are extraordinarily provocative and discomforting. And imagine how much more impoverished we would be if, for example, our art were constrained in a way where it never made anybody feel uncomfortable. We have to, I think, have that as part of who we are. My name is Hazel Six, uh, and my, I have two quick questions. Uh, one is, when the when the uh, the the free I'm a great believer in free speech, but when the free speech is threatening, do you think? And then. I, I did hear one of the women who was uh, a uh, president of a university say, well, we can't take action on speech, we have to have actions. But when the, when the actions are actually killing people, I don't think there's a, a way to have actions, and it can be very threatening. So that's the, my one question on the free speech issue. The other is about uh, people who are teaching at Princeton. I got a report some time back, and tell me if, I was, if that was wrong, about someone who was teaching a course in which she had a, a book that was anti-Semitic. I mean, it was like the, what are the, Thosa Protocol. I mean, it, it talked about IDF soldiers killing small children. And, uh, and it, it was, you know, really not, not a, a real book that should be taught. So, and everybody assumes that the, t that the books that are given in the class are all, you know, uh, they may not, you may not agree with them, but that they will have truth in them. So what happens in a situation like that? So the, uh, on the first question about the relationship between uh, speech and action, I, I, I think, uh, you, you know, I must say my heart goes out to and my sympathies are with the president who were uh, obliged to uh, testify under hot lights for three plus hours. But I, th I think they made a mistake, I mean, a mistake as just a matter of law in saying that you have to wait for speech to become action before you're able to 
um, respond to it in some way, including at times through disciplinary sanctions. That's not the standard under the law. As I've said a couple of times, American rules are very speech protective. So uh, what you need is a genuine threat, a genuine threat or, or harassment. And, and a genuine threat is something different than what might happen if somebody just says, I feel threatened by that. We may all feel threatened by certain kinds of speech. The legal standards and our standards as a university are more discerning uh, than that. Likewise around harassment, but you don't have to wait for the action to take place. It's just that the category is very narrow. Your, your second question is about, I think, the book that was assigned by Professor Satyal Larson in Near Eastern Studies at the beginning of uh, last year. And I defended her right to assign the book, which I would characterize a little differently. I think it was a, a harshly critical uh, book and, and a kind of argumentative screed, if you will, directed at uh, Israel, published through the Duke University uh, Press. But the rules of academic freedom provide that our faculty members have tremendous latitude to decide what to assign, particularly in areas that are within the scope of their judgment, that is under the supervision of the departments that oversee the courses, and then ultimately of the professors themselves. And they may assign books for a variety of reasons, right? A, 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 a professor may require someone to read something that is awful and hateful, not because they think it is right, but because they think it is important to uh, discuss what the, what the book is about. You have to be able to teach about hate, right? There is somebody who runs at Bard College and helped to write the, the uh, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism who teaches a course on hate. And I'm leaving the science mind Kampf in that course because he believes students need to read it to understand the phenomenon that they are studying. We give our professors tremendous latitude and then we have a set of very rigorous procedures around how we appoint those professors, whether or not they are promoted, whether or not they are tenured. I think they are the most rigorous procedures that I have ever encountered in a personnel process. And that is how we produce the best research and scholarship in the United States, and according to many people, the best undergraduate education in the United States. But it would be worse, once again, if I censored, it would be worse, the education that we produced. I think this will be our last one, okay. except the one that I'm going to ask. <laughs> My name is Sherry Rosen. Hi. Hi. Uh, you, I thought you earlier alluded to some difference between classroom protocol and campus rules. So I'm just curious what specifically constitutes classroom protocol. And as a former faculty member, not at Princeton, is there tension around, uh, can, the, can the individual professor uh, put into place rules and protocol individually, to what extent is, is there a problem with this is sync between a classroom protocol and the policy that you're describing? Go, go. Yeah, so the, the, the classroom circumstances are very different from the overall free speech environment, right? The overall free speech environment at certain points on our campus becomes like a public park under kind of American law. People can say what they want to say and they can shout at each other at times. In the classroom, you can't do that. And moreover, we have a set of rules designed to facilitate and require respectful exchange in the classroom. These rules, which I'm very proud of, they don't, they, they don't exist actually in the uh, rules of many university campuses. So they exist on ours because in one of the events that I described earlier in response to Maryland's uh, question, when uh, one of our faculty members used to he, or, or articulated, right, he, he wasn't directing it at anybody, but he articulated the N-word in, uh, in a classroom. Students got very upset. We protected the uh, professor's academic freedom to teach in the way that he thought permissible. And then we convened a committee of faculty members with a very wide variety of views and disciplinary backgrounds to write a set of provisions which you can find online in the rules and procedures of the faculty of Princeton University, describing what it means for students to treat one another respectfully in a classroom. And, and professors can make some modifications around that, but they are obliged, for example, to recognize that students from different political perspectives will have to be treated with, um, with respect in the uh, classroom and that students must treat one another with respect and that's backed up, right? This, this is what I think we have at Princeton that I'm not sure that any of our peers have, a well-articulated set of guidelines, which I think are really good, that are then backed up 
by the uh, disciplinary authority of the dean of the faculty. That is to say that professors have to be willing, for example, to allow students to challenge some of their own presuppositions. That's part of what goes on in the classroom. But that kind of speech is different from this more unregulated atmosphere outside of it. First of all, thank you so much for making our... I think from most of the questions underlying them, you heard pain. Yeah. And, and that's something that I want to notice, that we are a community that's a little bit in pain, and we are so glad that you are the president of the university. Thank you. <laughs> and you won't have a long time to answer this one, because we're going to start the afternoon service in just a few moments. You opened telling us a little bit about your own personal history. Yeah. So if you, if you would, has there been anything about your own Jewish journey that has surprised you or that you love about now, I don't know if you consider yourself, I think you consider yourself part of the Jewish community, yes. and, and, and what has been fascinating or life-giving or beautiful for you? Uh, th there's been a lot that has been uh, beautiful and, and life-affirming. I mean, I, uh, for me, right, I felt that uh, the discovery of my Jewish identity completed something. It supplied, a, if you would, a, a puzzle piece that I didn't know was uh, missing. Uh, it connected me with an enormous number of uh, relatives here and in Israel that I did not know that I uh, had. and. Uh, with whom I immediately forged uh, bonds that are very meaningful to me. And it connected me to a cultural tradition that I find uh, very important and, and a source of both uh, wisdom and joy in my life. So I'm not religious. I wasn't before uh, I discovered my Jewish identity, and, and it, it did not change my theological beliefs to, to discover uh, my ancestry, but uh, I had always, because I wasn't religious, I considered myself non-Christian in a Christian country, both an outsider and an insider, uh, in, in a way that I take insight from the Jewish tradition, and I, I, I find, um, as I said, sources of uh, community that are important to me uh, in our center of Jewish life and uh, new ways of relating to people that I have known for a long time. So I, I appreciate the question. Thank, thank you so much. And I am sorry personally that you've had two incidents of anti-Semitism against you personally. Um, we are so happy that you have a home at the CJL. And um, Rabbi Steinloff is an active member here, although he's on campus today. But if you ever want to come hang out with the adults and not the kids, <laughs> Um, the Jewish Center really is a center, and you don't have to be religious to be here. You just have to be someone who is interested in Jewish peoplehood and Jewish community. And we are thrilled that you are here, and we wish you a Shana Tova. Happy Thank New Year. You. Thank you.